Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series where we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Corrupting Influence Precon from Phyrexia All Will Be One and its face commander, Ixil Scion of Atraxa, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and which commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Ixil Scion of Atraxa is a 2-5 Phyrexian Angel with Flying, Vigilance, and Toxic 2 that has the following ability. At the beginning of our end step, each opponent who has 3 plus poison counters on them exiles a the top card of their deck face down. We may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled, and we may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast them. Breaking down Ixil's core stats, she possesses a decently high CMC, a below average stat block for her cost, but making up for it with keywords that grant her evasion to more easily get in for damage, poison counter distribution to make up for her low power, and the ability to remain untapped after attacking to use her high toughness to intercept incoming attacks, and an ability that takes advantage of the poison counter she and other sources distribute to turn them into pseudo card advantage generated from our opponent's decks rather than our own. Taking a closer look at this ability, it functions somewhat like a Gaunti Lord of Luxury's ETB effect, in which the exiled cards can be viewed and played by us following normal timing restrictions, allowing us to use mana of any color to cast them to allow us to use spells outside our slice of the color pie, and not requiring Ixil to be on the battlefield in order to cast the exiled cards, allowing us to still have access to them even if she's removed. And due to Ixil's version of this effect saying play not cast, we're still able to play any lands we exile with this effect as well to help us make our land drops as a bonus. Now to be fair, unlike Gonti who just needs to ETB to do this, Ixil will require some setup in order to get this ability going in the form of loading up our opponents with poison counters. Luckily, she can reliably deliver to a turn thanks to her built-in Toxic 2 and Evasion, but in order to get maximum value out of her ability, we'll be wanting to use other sources of Toxic, Infect, and Proliferate to get those three counters on our opponents as quickly as possible. Since once we do so, we'll effectively be drawing three cards a turn so long as our commander on the battlefield, which is an impressive amount of passive card advantage. So, as we can see, Ixil is clearly a commander that cares about getting poison counters on our opponents, but primarily to generate value from them instead of eliminating them outright like other infect commanders, since when they go, their exiled cards go with them. As such, in order to generate as much value as possible off our opponents before they succumb to their poison counters, I decided to take this build in a poison counter pillow fort direction, aiming to make ourselves as hard as possible to attack while we spread our poison counters, using our opponent's own cards against them as the poison counters accumulate, and then finishing them all off simultaneously with one final dose of poison. Luckily for us, the Precon already has a very solid foundation of both Toxic and Infect creatures, as well as additional sources of poison counter distribution and proliferate to deliver and multiply our opponent's poison counters, which we'll be refining by adding in additional evasive sources of Infect and Toxic, as well as ways to make our other creatures evasive so they can deliver their infectious payload as well, and capping it all off with means to take advantage of our creatures and commander's low base power in order to generate additional value. And on the defensive side, since our opponents will likely be gunning for us right out of the gate since we're technically an Infect deck, we'll be adding on to the core build's decent number of Pillow Fort pieces with some of our own additions to make it even harder for our opponents to swing into us, giving us more time to take advantage of the resources we steal from them until they're completed and join us. So let us planeswalk to New Phyrexia and see for ourselves Atraxa's prized creation, Ixil. A Phyrexian angel like her progenitor, Ixil was created for a singular purpose, to be used as a weapon, Atraxa's living blade to execute those who dare defy the will of the Praetors and her master. And like any good weapon, she never questioned her place or the will of her masters, that is, until she was sent to assassinate Geth. 
Geth had been branded a traitor, a heretic, willfully allying himself with Urabraska against Elishnorn. For this, he had to die, and Ixo was given the order by Atraxa to bring back his head. But even as his lifeless head toppled to the ground, his final words stayed with her. What do you live for? Why do you exist? It was a thought that had never occurred to her. She was a weapon after all. Atraxa's will was her will, wasn't it? It was at that moment she decided to put that to the test, and upon returning to Atraxa, she did not bring Geth's head as ordered, but a newly completed Phyrexian she had created from it, Vishgraz, to present to her master, a new soldier to spread the will of Phyrexia. But it was here that she would learn the truth, the utter look of disdain from her creator saying it all. She was not a creator, she was a weapon. This thing that she made was not only an insult to her progenitor, but a defiance of her will and was to be disposed of at once, leaving Ixel only bitter guilt and self-hatred at her hubris. She followed Atraxa's orders, releasing Vishgraz into the dross pits, part of her wishing she could follow her creation, to run away from a destiny that was never hers in the first place, but she could not. She was a weapon. Atraxa's will was her will after all. At least, that's what she told herself. So, now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Starting off with the creatures we'll be keeping from the core build, we'll be aiming to keep a large number of ones that can deliver poison counters to our opponents either via Infect or Toxic, preferably those with either built-in evasion to bypass blockers or some additional utility for us to take advantage of. That means we'll be keeping both Pestilence Siphoner and Plague Stinger, as their built-in evasion allows them to easily connect with our opponents to deliver poison counters, Mere Convert and Plague Mirror, both of which pull double duty as poison counter distributors and mana dorks to help speed up our mana base, Iker Claw Mirror, which is a good combination of cheap, low power enough to enable our low power payoffs, but can still serve as a decent body with Infect when blocked to trade up, Igger Rats and Blight Belly Rat, each of which are able to distribute poison counters as they connect, as well as when they ETB or die respectively. Bilious Skull Dweller and Blight Mamba, which are both solid defensive options for our Pillow Fort playstyle, thanks to being able to trade with most things it blocks in the former's case, or being able to stick around after combat while making whatever it fought weaker in the latter's. And Viridian Corruptor, which is a nice combination of back row removal and poison counter generation to provide solid disruption as well as further our game plan. Then to close out our poison counter distributors, we'll be keeping Contaminant Grafter, whose high power admittedly doesn't synergize well with the low power payoffs we'll be adding to the build, but the passive proliferate, card advantage, and ramp it provides being more than enough to make up for it, and Phyrexian Swarmlord, which serves as another excellent poison counter payoff which may not proc our low power payoffs, but the swarms of 1-1s with infected will be creating sure will, helping us rapidly build up our board with additional poison counter distributors and close out games. Then from there, it's on to some proliferating creatures that carried over from the base build that will allow us to multiply our opponent's poison counters once they've been infected, with Grateful Apparition staying in as another evasive body that can easily crack in to multiply their counters, Evolution Sage keeping its spot as a landfall source of proliferate, which works very well with our land-based ramp to potentially get multiple uses out of per turn, and Norn Squire Master staying in as well, who serves as a massive body with flying and first strike that we can leave up to block both evasive and non-evasive threats, while it enables our commander to proliferate our opponent's poison counters every time she swings in. And then as our final creature holdover, Windborn Muse will be holding on to her spot as well, serving as the first of many Pillow Fort pieces we'll either be carrying over from the base build, or we'll be adding in to make attacking into us as difficult as possible for our opponents, allowing us to generate value off of them and spread our poison counters undisturbed for as long as possible. Then moving on to our instant carryovers, it's going to be mostly removal that we're holding on to from the base build, with Swords to Plowshare staying in as a dirt cheap source of exile creature removal, Beast Within, Mortify, and Putrefy all keeping their spots as flexible removal that will help us deal with a wide variety of threats, and Vraska's Fall making it in as well as a decent enemy-only edict effect that also spreads poison counters around, both bypassing conventional defenses while furthering our win condition. And lastly, Noxious Revival will be keeping its spot as a fantastic reprint that essentially lets us recur the best card in our graveyard at no mana cost, which is fantastic to bring back powerful one-time use effects or threats that our opponents dealt with previously to be used again. It's then on to our selection of sorcery carryovers, in which we're mostly interested in keeping entrants that fulfill the build's core stats quota. 
With Knight's Whisper and Painful Truths both staying in as generically decent sources of card advantage, Infectious Inquiry keeping its spot as a more on-theme source of card advantage that also spreads poison counters, Cultivate carrying over as a stable piece of land ramp, and Phyresis Outbreak wrapping up our sorcery carryovers by serving as an on-theme, one-sided non-destruction board wipe that also spreads more poison counters around, helping us both keep control of the board and continue progressing our win condition. Then proceeding to our Captain Enchantments, we'll only be keeping Ghostly Prison and Norn's Decree, both of which are solid pillow fort pieces that help the incentivize or straight up prevent attacks from coming our way as we spread our poison counters to our opponents, with the latter even providing additional card advantage as we swing into already poisoned players as a bonus. It's our held over artifacts, then up next, starting with the Mana Rocks, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and Chromatic Lantern, all of which keep their spots thanks to helping us speed up and or fix our mana base to help us get to Ixhill as quickly as possible, as well as Glistening Sphere, which again provides decent ramp and fixing while also serving as an additional source of proliferate as well as poison counter payoff that improves our mana base even further. It's then on to some poison counter spreading artifacts that kept their spots, with Contagion Clasp staying in as a decent source of repeatable proliferate with some non-destruction removal attached, and Grafted Exoskeleton retaining its spot thanks to granting a decent stat bump and infect to any of our evasive creatures, along with any creatures we cast off our opponent's decks to make them even deadlier. And finally, Norn's Annex carries over as another solid pillow fort piece that will either force our opponents to pay white mana or, more likely, life in order to be able to attack us. Which, to be fair, isn't too useful to us since we're aiming to win through poison counters, but the life loss it incurs can leave them vulnerable to other players at the table with more conventional win conditions if they decide to swing out at us. And lastly, reaching our land holdovers from the base build, we'll be keeping Command Tower, Path of Ancestry, and Sandsteep Citadel, all of which tap for all our colors to provide excellent fixing, Exotic Orchard, which we'll generally be able to use to generate most of our colors off our opponents since we're in a three-color deck, Fortified Village, Necroblossom Snarl, and Shine Shadow Snarl, which are all solid dual lands that we can usually get into play untapped due to the number of basic lands we're running, Canopy Vista, which is another solid duel that usually comes into play untapped and is searchable by some of the ramp effects in the final build since it's both a plains and a forest, Sungrass Prairie, which serves as a decent filter land to help fix our colors, Tainted Field and Tainted Wood, each of which come online very quickly to tap for two of our colors thanks to our final build Swamp Count, and finally Corrosive Verge and Myriad Landscape, both of which provide decent land ramp from our land slot to further speed up our mana base, the former even allowing us to fetch up some non-basic plains and forests, which is relevant for Canopy Vista along with some of the lands we'll be adding to the build. Then reaching our utility lands, we'll be holding on to Bajugabog, which is a solid source of graveyard hate to help us combat against any graveyard-focused builds we may encounter, as well as Karn's Bastion, which serves as a repeatable source of proliferate from our land slot, which when combined with our Pillow Fort playstyle, quickly turns into a countdown timer for our opponents as it increases all their poison counters turn after turn. And finally, we'll be keeping 5 plains, 5 swamps, and 5 forests from the base build as our basics to round out our mana base. That leaves us with a final tally of 68 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 32 cards to replace. So, now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Beginning with our creature upgrades, we'll first be aiming to improve our selection of poison counter delivering creatures by adding in some members with built-in evasion to more easily connect with our opponents. As such, we'll be replacing Canker Bloom's self-sacking removal slash proliferation and Venomous Brutalizer's non-evasive Toxic 3 and one-time proliferation effect in favor of Whispering Spectre and Flensing Raptor, both of which offer more consistent poison counter delivery thanks to their built-in flying, with the former also being a solid counter payoff to disrupt our opponent's hands, and the latter granting our other toxic creatures temporary evasion to allow us to get even more poison counters on our opponents. Then continuing on this trend, we'll be cutting Mycosynth Fiend, whose stat increased based on poison counters doesn't really help us too much in this build since we're aiming to win through poison instead of damage, as well as Glissa's Retriever, whose pseudo evasion is decent but is not good enough to get in for damage reliably, and replacing them with Flesh Eater Imp and Tyne Shrike to again add more evasive means to load up our opponents with poison counters and get Excel's Corruption Trigger online as reliably as possible, with the former being particularly deadly if we have spare bodies 
around to inject even more poison into our opponents if left unblocked. Sadly, Bishgraz the Doomhive will also be getting the axe here, as he would be a better fit in a build of his own where he could put his increased stats to use to win through commander damage or infect, while the mites he creates can support him by spreading poison counters. So we'll be giving his slot to Core Prowler, whose power is low enough to benefit from the low power payoffs we'll be adding to the build, and whose combination of infect and on death proliferate will make it tricky to block or remove effectively without spreading more poison counters across the table one way or another. Then quickly running down our remaining poison counter creature swaps, we'll be cutting scavenging oozes admittedly decent graveyard hate in favor of Necrogen Rot Priest, whose additional poison counter distribution and death touch granting for our commander and other toxic creatures helps speed up our game plan, while making it miserable to attack into us or block our creatures. Carrion Call's subpar token creation will be replaced with Reaper of Shouldred, whose defensive stat block infect and on damage poison counter generation makes it a superb creature to leave up to punish any opponents who swing into us, and Unnatural Restoration's Recursion and Proliferate will be swapped for Finn the Fang Bearer, who serves as another cheap defensive body whose built-in death touch will make him difficult to be attacked into, and whose pseudo-toxic 2 makes for a cheeky source of additional poison counters should the opportunity present itself, whether it be through granting him evasion or if our opponents leave themselves open. Then switching gears from sources of poison counters to some additional pillow fort pieces, we'll be cutting the reanimation spells Geth Summons and Vat Emergence, which are fine, but we don't have the graveyard set up and powerful reanimation targets needed to get the maximum value out of them in this build, and replacing them with Baird Steward of Argive and Archon of Absolution, both of which fit in nicely into our pillow fort playstyle by passively making it even harder to attack into us, which we'll certainly be needing once the poison counters on our opponents start getting high. From there, we'll be adding some ways to enable our low power creatures to be able to safely swing into our opponents. With the subpar draw spell Carassa Phyrexia and the single target evasion granting Trailblazer's Boots being exchanged out for Siddhar Kondo of Jamora and Champion of Lamholt, both of which are able to make our entire board evasive by taking advantage of their low power or our build's increased creature count respectively, giving all our low power non-evasive infect and toxic creatures the ability to swing in safely and speed up our win condition considerably. And as our last upgrades to our creature base, we'll be making some adjustments to our core stats to better fit with our low power direction, with the two death dependent Moldervine Reclamation and the subpar Feed the Infection being replaced with the more on theme draw sources Mentor of the Meek and Welcoming Vampire, both of which turn our low power creatures into card advantage as they come into play to keep our hands nice and full, and a bit too basic ramp for Exian Atlas being swapped out for Sakura Tribe Elder, who comes down faster, provides land based ramp to help thin our deck and can occasionally proc our low power payoffs as well for some additional value. Then skipping our instance, since we won't be adding any new entries to that category, we'll move straight to our sorcery upgrades, which will consist primarily of quality of life changes to our core stats. For example, we'll be swapping out the Mana Rocks, Felwar Stone, Golgari Signet, and Commander Sphere for the Land Ramp Sources, Rampant Growth, Farseek, and Nature's Lore, all of which still provide us with the mana acceleration we're looking for with the added benefit of being much less vulnerable to our opponent's removal attempts, and the latter two even fetching up non-basics for even better fixing. Similarly, we'll be axing the overcosted and unreliable ramp spell Expand the Sphere and adding in Kodama's Reach in its place, which is not only cheaper, but also, unlike its predecessor, guarantees we'll be able to ramp the turn we play it and still make our land drop on the following turn, which goes a long way to improve the deck's consistency, especially in the early game. Then pivoting from ramp to wipes, we'll be swapping out the very flexible wipe Merciless Eviction in favor of the more on game plan wipe Dusk to Dawn, which is oftentimes a one sided wipe for us considering most of our creatures low base power, in addition to also being able to recur most of our creature base once it's used in case we need to rebuild our board at some point throughout the course of the game. And lastly, as our final sorcery swap, we'll be replacing the Wipe Phyrexian Rebirth for the win condition Plain Wide Celebration, whose ability to proliferate four times will help us close out games out of nowhere, which is much more valuable to us than simply clearing the board to start from scratch. It's then on to our enchantment upgrades, which will mostly consist of new pillow fort pieces to make it even harder and more unappealing for our opponents to attack into us, thus keeping us in the game for longer despite being viewed as a poison slash infect deck. 
so we'll be exchanging out the unimpressive poison overrun noxious assault, the decent but unnecessary wipe in this build culling ritual, and the powerful but off theme poison counter payoff worm quake for elephant grass, Kuskin falls, and sphere of safety, all of which force our opponents to either leave us alone or pay a considerable amount of mana to attempt to touch our life totals, which we then have the opportunity to block with our high toughness and or infectious blockers, often resulting in the attack being a wash even if they are able to pay the mana to perform it. We'll also be cutting the life gain focused board wipe fumigate for cunning rhetoric, another pillow fort piece that doesn't prevent attacks but does serve as an extra copy of our commander's ability if our opponents choose to attack into us, allowing us to generate additional pseudo card advantage off of their attacks that we can then in turn use against them. And then stepping away from pillow fort pieces for our last enchantment upgrade, we'll be cutting a swamp to make room for behind the scenes, which provides us with another way for our low power creatures to get in for damage thanks to the AoE skulk it provides, enabling potentially game ending alpha strikes when it comes down if our board state is developed enough. Our Planeswalker upgrades are then up next, in which we'll be replacing a Planes from the base build to make room for a Johnny Sleeper Agent, who provides us with card advantage and card selection as well as a way to pump our infect creatures if necessary, but we'll be primarily playing for his minus 6 ability that takes advantage of our increased creature base and those we steal from our opponents to quickly distribute poison counters, which we can easily get to the turn he comes down in this build thanks to the multiple sources of proliferate we're running, allowing us to close out out games relatively quickly behind our defenses. And finally, reaching our land upgrades, we'll be swapping out Temple of Malady, Temple of Plenty, and Temple of Silence for Haunted Mire, Radiant Grove, and Sunlit Marsh, all of which work much better with our improved ramp package thanks to their basic land types making them much easier to fetch up, and as our last change, we'll be cutting a plains and a swamp to make room for Rogue's Passage and Access Tunnel, providing our build with one last bit of evasion for our infect and toxic creatures to make use of to close out games on otherwise clogged board states. So, now that we've covered all 32 cards that we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. This deck currently has 32 creatures including the Commander, 6 Instants, 11 Sorceries, 7 Enchantments, 7 Artifacts, 1 Planeswalker, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have a total of 28 sources of poison counters, 14 cards that care about poison counters, 10 sources of proliferate, 27 creatures with 2 or less power, 10 creatures with built-in evasion or sources to grant them evasion, 6 low power payoffs, and 10 pillow fort cards, giving us a decent number of ways to distribute poison counters to our opponents, multiplying them and benefiting from them, as well as providing a solid low power sub-theme with plenty of evasion and ways to grant evasion to ensure our poisonous damage gets through while we generate additional value, and finally capping off with a good number of pillow fort pieces to make attacking into us undesirable at best and impossible at worst for our opponents to keep us in the game for as long as possible. For general deck stats, we have 15 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 7 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp being slightly higher than normal since we'll want to get to Ixil as quickly as possible and then have enough mana to cast our opponent's spells as well, while our removal is low to make room for more poison counter sources and in theory can be supplemented by any removal we hit off our opponent's decks, with our draw and wipes falling within more typical ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 5 1 drops, 16 2 drops, 23 3 drops, 11 4 drops, 5 5 drops, 2 6 drops, 1 7 drop, and 1 9 drop, leaving us with a lighter weight curve that aims to ramp hard in the early game while dropping some cheap sources of poison counters, followed by Ixil to begin benefiting from her pseudo card advantage as soon as possible. From there, we'll be making ourselves as hard as possible to attack with our defensive pillow fort pieces while supplementing any weaknesses in our build off our opponent's decks, all while our evasive infect and toxic creatures as well as our proliferation sources slowly increase the poison counters on our opponents into a lethal dose. The final price of this build then comes out to be 7513 after upgrades. This price does not include tax or shipping and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. 
For side grades, if we want to lean more into the low power matter side of the deck, we can exchange out Champion of Lamholt for Fell the Mighty as another low power board wipe to help us keep control of the board, as well as swapping out Reaper of Shouldred for Solar Tide in case we really want to keep the board clear of anything other than our smaller creatures. Then for upgrades, Cutting Blight Mamba for Skrelv Defector Might would give us another way to grant any of our poison counter distributing creatures evasion to more easily get in, as well as protection from our opponent's attempts to remove them. Vraska's Fall can be removed to make room for Contagion Engine, which not only serves as a repeatable source of proliferate, but also slowly erodes our opponent's boards away with minus one minus one counters. Painful Truths can be axed in favor of Roska Betrayal Sting, who provides repeatable card draw, proliferate, and removal, along with an ult that leaves an opponent on the cusp of elimination if we're able to get to it, and Bilius Skull Dweller can be replaced with Venerated Rot Priest, who makes targeting any of our creatures undesirable unless our opponents want to spread even more poison around. And lastly, we can remove Sungrass Prairie to make room for Inkmoth Nexus, which provides us with another evasive source of infect, this time from our Lancelot, to allow us to chip in for those poison counters both in the early and late game, though we'll end up having to pay a premium price for the poison it delivers to roughly the tune of all the main build's upgrades combined. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I'd first like to give a big thanks to all the channel subscribers for helping us crack both the 9.2k and 9.3k subscriber milestones. Thank you all for your continued support as it's the primary reason this channel keeps growing. Now taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like Vishgraz was able to claw his way to the top spot, so look forward to an aggressive poison counter build featuring him soon. Then moving on to this week's poll, we'll be getting a fresh batch of contenders from Phyrexia All Will Be One based on your suggestions from the comments of previous videos. Those contenders being the Rebellious Might Skrelv Defector Might, the Quiet Furnace Guardian Kathic Crucible Goliath, and the Spell Slinging Nightmare Okiva Enigma Goliath. Please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Phyrexia All Will Be One in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank Sahir21 for another generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Sahir21, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.